Always got to start off with the, <laughs> the coffee sip. Sorry about that. Hello, everybody. Uh, hello, my fellow engineers. Uh, welcome to another uh, episode of GSE. I'm here today with uh, Tavon James. And, uh, hello. And our, our guest, uh, Mr. Campbell, Graham Campbell. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing very well, thank you. Yes, sir. So uh, you agreed to come on and uh, do an interview. Uh, so we actually have some questions for you. Okay. Okay. Um, my first question to you, sir, is what inspired you to pursue a career in film? Well, that's a, uh, that could be a long answer. Uh, I used to, when I was a teenager, I used to write short stories and stuff. And um, although uh, for a while I thought I was going to be some kind of a scientist, I started to really do badly in physics and chemistry and so on. So, but my stories kept, I kept writing those and I kept reading a lot. And I thought it might be good to maybe look at other, other storytelling avenues, such as filmmaking. And so I wanted to pursue that. And then really, I saw a print in a classroom of John Cassavetti's faces. And I thought, that is an amazing. That is amazing. And I want to do that. So that was what really kicked me over the, uh, over the line, as it were. Okay. And so I, I, you know, I went to, you know, I worked in, I worked as a production assistant. I went to school. I went to film school. Uh, I worked as an editor. Uh, eventually, I parlayed that into directing. And I am. Wow, that's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So, how long have you uh, been working in the film industry? I guess my first job was 1975. Wow. Huh. What was you? Uh, what was you doing? Production assistant. Okay. I made fifty dollars for a week. <laughs> oh wow! That was good. That's dedication. That was good. <laughs> I also worked for free, but I mean, I did get fifty bucks for a week there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fifty dollars now is way different than then. I know that for sure. Yeah. But there are people, you know, there is, um, I would not, uh, I would not suggest you work for $50 a day. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, uh, and probably in like in the indie field, you believe? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that's interesting. Note it, note it. Note it. <laughs> <laughs> Difficulty these days, is the sort of corporate takeover of the entire industry. So the, the squeezing out the entrepreneur, really. And, um, you know, the streamers, they're all owned by major corporations. The stock market plays a huge um, role in the, in the success of the, whoever, success or failure of the companies. Um, you know, when I started, the stu the, even the studios were, I think one of them might have been owned by a corporation. They were otherwise, they, Columbia was Columbia. Now they're all owned by multinational corporations, and even the the business is even some kind of a line item on a larger uh, corporate balance sheet, and it's becoming very difficult to to to, to support a, like a unique vision. It, you know, in this corporate uh, the the. the that type, I mean, I'm not expressing myself very well, but uh, a, an individual artist vision like John Cassavetes or Martin Scorsese seems to be going away. We have a few. Uh, you know, Greta Gerwig managed to somehow, but she had to recut Barbie a lot um, thanks to her masters. But I don't think it mattered in her case. <laughs> but... Um, you know, it's just harder and harder for that to happen, um, you know, these days. Hopefully the pendulum will swing back. Yeah, because I was just about to ask, uh, when it comes to um, creativity, um, when it comes to film production, I know a lot is that, um, that when it comes to, like, studio interference, it makes it really harder uh, when it comes to uh, directing and, a creative difference. In, uh, so you're saying that is the biggest challenge in film production? Uh, no, 
I, it's, it, that is a, those are not in production. That would be the biggest challenge in finding a unique voice. Like, who's the next Charlie Chaplin? Who's the next, um, you know, who's the next auteur? The, the, this has sort of gone, gone away and been, become buried in various mergers and acquisitions, streaming. Um, you know, we don't really... There, there used to be a star that could open a picture. Now that seems to be going away. Um, you know, I myself watch a lot of uh, Spanish language stuff so I can learn Spanish. If I'm not watching it, <laughs> I watch it in English, then I replay it with no subtitle, then I replay it with a Spanish subtitle. Or, oh. You know, I turn around like that. And, it, and then, you know, that helps me out. But it's not a, a filmmaking experience, you know. I mean, although I do get totally lost in it. Like I thought Narcos was a great series, but I've been buried in it, and I didn't learn much Spanish from it, to tell you the truth. I'll be real. I have never seen Narcos, but I know all my friends just want me to like, hey, you know, you should watch Narcos. I'm like, ah. <laughs> I should. I've heard good stuff. Yeah, I've heard good stuff about Narcos on my list too. But yeah, um, that's it. Like, okay. so, what's the Sopranos? You know? Mm-hmm. So it's been it's been a while since I watched that. Yeah, I watched it again all all six seasons of it last year. Oh wow, that was, it was great. Yeah, it's been out for so long that people just like to spoil it, you know. So when I when I first watched The Sopranos, like a lot of people were just spoiling it for me. Whenever I was into it, I was like, yeah, I kind of knew that was going to happen. And um, <laughs> um no one is safe yeah no one is safe so mr campbell i do have another question for you so uh, it's about murder one okay um i believe that was your first feature for miramax it was uh it was my second feature but yes it was for miramax um it was that was a that was a great experience uh, well, the harrowing experience. I mean, we really had we were very faithful to an actual true life crime spree, and uh, you know, all of us who made the movie, we we tried to make it as as authentic as possible, and so it was like being there. You know, um, we even got uh, an X rating on that movie uh, because the violence was so they felt the violence was so real. I mean. When you look at it, we had we had six killings in that movie, whereas the movie that came out at the same time was, uh, uh, you know, I forget, some action picture, and it had 127 killings in it. Oh, wow. It got, a, it got an R rating. We got an, an X, you know, so we had to trim trim it back to make it less realistic. I think in those in those cases, they, they made the, the, the violence cartoony or, or entertaining. And in our case, we wanted to make it disturbing uh, that, you know, like you, you would feel that. Uh, and so, you know, we had, we had that, uh, that issue. So, but yes, I worked with Harvey Weinstein. Cheers, Harvey. Cheers. Oh, man. Yeah, I wasn't going to mention that one. But yeah, Harvey yeah, Weinstein. Oh, well, Harvey Weinstein actually owned Miramax, I believe, right? Yeah, uh, he and his brother, um, Harvey and... Forget the other guy. They started as... They scalped, They were scalping... They were ticket scalpers for concerts. And then they became... Then they would buy blocks of seats and then they would sell them. And then they somehow moved into movies after that. Would let's say to wants to start to be like an indie film director or want to create their projects. Yeah. Do you have any advice for them to well, start yeah, off? This, one thing that is really, uh, you know, how things have advanced uh, right now is that the 
cameras, you can get a great, you know, a perfectly good camera, let's say, for nothing or next to it. And mm -hmm. the, you don't need as much lighting. So you can make a good looking show even with your cell phone. Which that, and so that means that you have the, the ability to go out and you write something and do it with your friends and cut it together and, and it can look great. And that can be a calling card. You know, and years ago when you had to get film and you had to get a, a processing, you had to rent these cameras and then you needed all kinds of stuff. You couldn't do that. Yeah. Now you can, I mean, there's, this is not exactly, when you go out and make your own film um, with your own money and without a distribution plan and so on, this is not exactly the most lucrative way to go about it, but you will have, a, you can make your own portfolio that you can then use uh, to, to, to try and, you know, be an emerging filmmaker. And you can, in, under those circumstances, you're not going to have any, any um, corporate interference with your voice or your vision. You can, uh, you can execute it. The only thing, that you will be up against is your lack of funds, but that's not as much of an issue now as it was. Uh, for example, I, this past winter, I made a short film with a partner, and we got we um, and entering it in a variety of festivals right now. And it its purpose is to uh, just be a kind of a, be able to make out of it, make various sizzle reels because we're writing a series concept. So it'll help sell that. That's, yeah. I think it's amazing that um, the tools that we have now uh, that people have access to, to actually go out and um, produce and, and develop and film their own uh, film is actually honestly kind of amazing. Um, yeah. Especially if they're like low budget. Uh, for example, uh, Godzilla minus one. I don't know if you ever seen that movie, Mr. Campbell. No, no. Uh, it was a, I believe, like a fourteen or fifteen million dollar budget, and I, I gotta say, it's for for the budget, for the uh, for the experience that these guys have. It was it was an amazing experience. Uh, definitely the best Godzilla movie, in my opinion, that that came out in recent years, and just a small and tight budget. Um, I'm not saying the 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 um, the CGI is a 10 out of 10, but you know what? It's just the story was so engaging. The um, well, of course, the, the, the story, the, the engaging story is all of it, really. Mm -hmm. So you can you can dress that up with a lot of money, or you can just do it for nothing. If it's an engaging story, you're you're uh, that's that's the main thing. We, we humans need stories, we respond to them. Mm -hmm. uh, trouble is, we're bombarded with so many of them. You know, we have YouTube, you can, YouTube, not, not just the streaming services, the network and the movie theaters and every other way you can see things. You have your, in, you can curate your own programming on YouTube uh, or any any of these platforms and so we 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 don't focus the eyeballs like we used to mm -hmm. i think that's also a problem that, that that's part of the issue i mean i remember lining up to go see raging bull i i thought i was going to make it to the early show but that was sold out so i had to wait in line and get to the next show and as it was in the middle of winter it was very cold but i was you know i would do that as did all these other people in line I don't know if that would happen anymore. Mm -hmm. It's definitely, um, in my opinion, I really think uh, when it comes to filming, a lot of people, I think, literally lost their their taste, maybe the flavor for it, you know, because um, we, honestly, I see movies that came out with 200, 300, 400 million dollar budgets, and they just don't land the mark. Um, no, and those are, the, like you said, these Mar Marvel movies. So. I'm glad, I'm glad you said it. Said it. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you said it. I liked Marvel comic books. I don't know about the. I'm, I mean, I don't know about these things anymore. Uh, that seems. Hopefully, that fad will go away. But 
You know, you could you make an episode of TV and you watch it in your on your 65 inch TV that's not even very expensive anymore with mm-hmm. a really good soundtrack. You basically can turn a one bedroom in, in apartment into a theatrical experience now. So, yeah. Yeah. People over there, a bit of popcorn, you you make it, you screening a movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's sure. kind of uh, crazy because of um the the pair that uh, that created the Saw franchise. Uh, yeah. Wong, what's his name? Uh, two guys from Australia. Yeah, straight out of college. Um, yeah. Did not have a big budget for the film whatsoever. The budget literally consists of like <laughs> filming it all in one room. And yeah. it's just a created like a million US dollars. Like a million US dollars, yes, sir. You're you're absolutely right. And it's it's just the fact that to me it's just when you're so limited that way, you know, you just tend to be way more creative, I believe. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, yeah I knew uh, that that's a project I I, I, was, I was briefly represented, represented by, by the company, company that, that made 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 that Evolution Entertainment, that would be about 20-something years ago. Yeah, they were uh, understandably super proud of that. And how many saws have they made now? Ten? I think so. (laughs) (laughs) And I think they're coming out with another one. Well, the The first first one was a fantastic fantastic movie. Oh, absolutely, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, because when it comes to movies like that, uh, you know, a lot of people look for the story. I definitely love to look first uh, and foremost the creativity that they use to create that film. I'm like, man, you know, they literally filmed this all in one room uh, with very limited actors, and they they just landed. I mean, obviously the style is different when they filmed it back in the early 2000s versus how it is now, but it still hasn't lost its uh, momentum, in my opinion. If I were to watch it to, again today, I would I, w- I would still be amazed on like how amazing uh, the creative team was into creating a film with just so limited resources. Yeah, well, horror is a genre you can do that because if as long as you can create an atmosphere, the implied the the implication is almost everything in horror, film, unless nothing but violence. But that's not so good. You take sobbing one but many years before that halloween look at look at the original halloween you're gonna see how many yeah. how many shots of doors are there there's nothing going on we're looking at a door but that's like in our minds what's behind the door so, yeah you know i imagine that movie's totally dated now but jamie lee curtis can't be that bad and that's yeah, that's the thing I think about like modern day industries, and it doesn't just affect the movie industry; it affects like music and like the gaming industry and all that stuff. Everyone is so focused on fidelity, but like the fidelity is supposed to support the engagement, the atmosphere that the the producers or the directors are trying to portray, that the actors are trying to portray with their emotions. Yeah, if you have something that looks good, and then there's no heart into it with the acting and the storytelling and stuff. If you're basically just watching a glorified slideshow, like it has to have something to the 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 visuals are supposed to be supported by the yeah. art that was put in by the cast. So it's like I see exactly what you're saying with that, like how the art seems to be lost, the focus seems to be lost. I mean, it's not it, it it's it's been obscured. I don't think it'll ever be lost, but uh, lately in the last uh, you know five years, you know, especially last year, leading up to all these strikes and everything else. The streaming company, they had streaming wars. They had to overproduce all this product. And they're talking about, you know, Martin Scorsese had an, had an interview, said, you know, we don't make movies anymore. We, we create content. And uh, that for him, there's, there's no cinema, there's just content. And, it, and he finds it to be, uh, you know, a, a tragedy. But I mean, I think he might be overreacting the uh it's true that we were bombarded with so much programming that we can't ever catch up i mean you say you haven't seen narcos that's because you saw 27 other things um you know it, it just you didn't get there yet right. uh, yeah 
and it's five years old and now you're still going to get a new thing. And <laughs> yeah, I could actually, I could contribute to that. Yeah. I, I agree with you on that, sir. Yeah. yeah it's, um, but it, you know, t name one art form, name one period of time, name in the history of the world, name one location, one country where it hasn't been a struggle to be an artist. So that's, this is a perpetual, it's a perpetual thing. The nature of the struggle changes. The struggle itself is always going to be there. Um, so how to be true to one's, uh, I tell you, you know, it, you have to balance with making a living versus pursuing your voice or what have you. That you have a couple point, actually. Well, you got a couple of kids and this, this, this script's the best script my banker ever read i gotta tell you that guys it's just <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. you know that's that's you know after you have a gap a gap in earnings for a year and a half you're gonna take the job right mm -hmm. so you know you always have the there's always these headwinds and uh i think uh some one of the tennis players uh might have been billy jean king so the pressure is a privilege. So you have to, I think, embrace that. We're always, we're all of us are going to be uh, have some kind of pressure, and you have to respond to that by, you know, you have to dig deep within yourself and, uh, you know, find new ways to do things. Whether, whether it's a thing that you create yourself or whether it's you're called upon to interpret someone else's material, you know. Um, I mean, I just stopped shooting on a Christmas movie, <laughs> but I think, you know, I've done a few of these because uh, this is, this is a, it, in the last 10 years, this has become a thing. Well, 20 years ago, there was the occasional Christmas movie. Now you're going to, you're going to Christmas in July, if you want. Yeah. Well, hopefully not uh, January. <laughs> any day of the year, you can have yeah. Christmas. Um, which I got to say, if, if I could say um, what you were talking about earlier, Mr. Campbell, um, it's honestly very inspiring because me personally, like I am wanting to be involved in the film industry. I always wanted to be a director, especially when I was a kid. Um, especially now, like I'm trying to work on my uh, first short film. And you're right. Uh, I think the, the two like maybe struggles is the equipment and funding, which I am building up on that. Um. Well, I'd say that um, in a sense uh, I could be forgiven for aspiring to be a director at my age but now that is not enough you know, it's not enough to be a director. It's not enough to be an actor. It's not enough to be one thing. Now you pretty much, because I think of the the technology gives us such uh, a wide uh, area of things to pursue. You have to mass be able to put these things together. So I think now, if you if you don't write, uh, this is a you're creating your own headwinds here. You, uh, you don't have to be a good writer, but you have to always write and always come up with stories, always come up with ideas for things at all times, I think, because otherwise when you do a directing job, which is, which is fine, like that, that's what most people do for most of the time, but <clears throat> to stay current, to stay ahead of the curve, to stay relevant, even if you're doing jobs, you got to be someone who is offering up a vision of a story, a, trying to sell something. Um, you know what I mean? Trying to put something together. Then you you'll be con you, you you'll be considered at that point. You know, I think you have to be a writer. You have to be a producer. You have to just you, being a director is not enough. And I don't think you can. Um, stop learning. I mean, some people learn from great writers, some people learn from great photographers, great, uh, you know, the, whatever inspires them at that point. 
there had been directors who were doctors. There were directors before that. There, you know. Uh, but you know, you know, it's it's pretty. It's a pretty all-encompassing uh, way of life, uh, and it's a it, you, your view of the world evolves over time. Uh, with your experiences, many of them, many of them great experiences, like and but many of them very, very challenging, very difficult. It's really hard on uh, family. It's very hard on, and you know, when you're starting out, you don't think of all these things. But when you when you live the career, you actually experience all these things. And the challenge then is to how to make these how to make these headwinds, these challenges, these difficulties, uh, how to make them the, your, your raw material for your story, you know, that makes you a better storyteller because you can understand or you can somehow relate to the challenges your characters are going through. You, so it, it, it's, um, it's a very difficult position to define. Martin Scorsese, who well, I quote a lot, he says, you, 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 if you're going to be a director, you're going to need it like oxygen. So it's not, I, I, I made a diagram once, I just did three. One, one was addiction, one was faith, and one was livelihood. And they got to kind of be in that balance. Most people, they get going and then livelihood takes over everything. And because they're, they they overspend and then they, they they're desperate for this job and the next thing you know they're you, it'd be whatever happened to so and so he just did a bunch of jobs and then he fell off the face of the earth you know um, we all have this uh, you know because you have to have you have to <laughs> got to keep a roof over your head you know so yeah amen to that. Mm. So, um, that, uh, did that, did that uh, help answer your question at all? <laughs> because it, it's yeah, um, which I'm very everything. Yes, yeah, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm definitely very grateful for that advice, sir. And okay. Obviously, hopefully, well, hopefully, I'll, 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 hopefully, I'll follow it myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Other thing, it's really difficult. You you know you should be doing something yet it's convenient to doing something else so you don't you know our our, our ability to not to, to not follow our discipline or our own you know i say yeah you got to write but wake up every day and write something even if it's nothing to say today you you're physically able to do that Will you even have the the stick to itiveness to do that? Think about it. It's really you know you you probably will miss six out of seven days, <laughs> <laughs> but if you keep it in your mind, eventually you will. You know. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's definitely um, for me. It's when I started writing. Um, I definitely try to look for um, relative like stuff like people that I could relate to. Um, I feel like that creates uh, um the engaging story when it comes to i mean in my opinion um yeah yeah and obviously like you know what we were talking about earlier like i feel like a lo some films lost that uh relation if that makes sense i, I don't know if i'm mm -hmm. making any sense but <laughs> yeah, yeah makes sense. you are okay uh t-von do you have any, any questions for mr campbell well like Given everything, do you feel like yeah, the drive you've had working those working for that fifty dollars a week or fifty dollars a day, sorry, and all that stuff? Well, that was a week. <laughs> it was a week. Sorry, yes. Yeah. So even more unbelievable. But like, yeah. Um, do you feel like that drive you had back then has it diminished, or have you? Do you feel a sense of self self um self satisfaction that you made it so far, starting from there? And that the world you have, that you, uh, live I, through, you know, I, I have, you know, you, you, you lose and rediscover these things. Um, I had that for the longest time. And then 
you know, I got overwhelmed. I did a lot of uh, television movies and then the television movie became not, well, it never kept up. It never, it never reinvented itself. And those who were making them weren't really interested in reinvention. So, you know, you become, it became for me repetitive and I became, you know, I, I, I lost uh, quite a bit of uh, drive. It, it was just, I was just doing the same thing again. And then of course, people who engaged me thought, Oh, him, he's just doing the same thing again. So, you know, I, I you know, my work petered out and so on. So, but lately uh, in the last few years, uh, I have rediscovered that. Um, and the last two years have been writing uh, projects that I've just, just feel like doing it. And, and I'm become very invigorated with that. So uh, I hopefully be able to these hopefully these can see the light of day somehow. But I'm you know I'm, I'm partnered with a uh, a wonderful young actress who I think is really going somewhere, and um, I think uh, the 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 drive I had for the fifty bucks a week, yeah, I have that. <laughs> um, didn't I must say much of this much of this development of of these screenplays that, that there's not even fifty bucks a week involved here. This is you know you're just doing it, um, so you got to. You know, Agreed. yeah. Never, uh, I think the, the the thing with age is, like they say, growing old isn't for sissies. This is true, but if there's a there's a a wisdom that I find invigorating. In in a sense, it's sort of like, oh, geez, I wish I knew this when I was thirty. Can't obviously, but I wish I did. A whole mess of mistakes, I'll tell you that. All right, so I did ask this to the email, and I'm I'm so curious because um, honestly, I'm a big uh, Gundam fan. So uh, whenever I noticed you made, it, I was like, you know, maybe maybe I should ask. But Mr. Cabro. What, how did you get involved with G Savior? That is, uh, okay. I, my agent at the time was, a uh, was British LA agent. His name was Tim stone. And he had an agency called stone manners, uh, that has been is morphed into something else now. And Tim has retired for a long time. So anyways, he was English and he knew this English other this English producer, and this English and his name was Phil. I forget his last name. And Phil had just created a new company with a couple of partners, and there was a Japanese group who wanted to make a live action Gundam. And they had written this script, G Savior, and they they had tried to shop it around in Hollywood, you know, to the studios. They wanted to make a big movie out of it, and they never got much of a response. So they brought it to this guy Phil, and then Phil was looking for a director, and he called his old friend Tim, and I happened to be his client. And I got the job. I have no, I, I have, you know, I had no experience remotely relevant to that movie. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did you know anything? Uh, did you know? <laughs> did you know? Any, <laughs> did you know? I'm sorry. Did you know anything about? Don't Gundam? apologize. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you? Did I you knew. Know, I'm sorry. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Um, Nothing. I read some notes uh, that said that uh, Sunrise was pretty much looking for Sunrise. a team that uh, had no clue, little to nothing about Gundam. Is that true? Well, uh, I don't know. They certainly got a team that knew nothing about Gundam. <laughs> um, yeah, I read this. Uh, I heard about the first script. 
um, because I read somewhere that like, the first script uh, they okay so obviously the mobile suits are the giant machines yeah um, so they I believe the writer um, obviously she didn't know anything about it she the first script didn't involve anything about mobile suits is that true the, the one I read the mobile suits were definitely part of it okay okay. I knew it. I knew what I when I got the job and when I found out about Gundam, I thought it was all about mobile suits. So um, I think that in our case, the I don't like the movie very much because it doesn't have enough mobile suit stuff in it. Okay. But the, you know, CG and the, all these visual effects back in 1999 when we made the movie were way, way, way more expensive than they are now. And so we always have to be concerned. We only have, we have, you know, uh, 38 uh, visual effects shots or something like that. And then now we'll have to chop that up into make them 76 visual effects shots or something. Now you get up hundreds of them for that money. And uh, one of the things that was really bad, which we overcame really nicely, Somebody that, that we had to make these cockpits. Each mobile suit had a cockpit. So each each mobile suit had its pilot, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that was in a kind of a control room. And that we and the cockpit was an element of the suit. So we shot the, the pilots in the cockpits and then extrapolated it that they would then be in these big, big, huge uh, 20 meter tall things, you know. That's at six, six feet or something. So we get these cockpits from L.A., the genius that made these things. We shot in Vancouver, and they get off the plane. And in the cockpits, there's nothing. There's no lights. There's no uh, flashing anything. Or We had to wire these cockpits with all kinds of blinkies and flashies and whatnot, each one differently and have them in the back so that when we shoot, like let's say within the confines of this screen, you'd see the pilot was surrounded by something. Otherwise it, it kind of looked like uh, my background here without the window. You know I mean, <laughs> it's just, yeah. Yeah, I, I just... So we had to throw that together in no time, you know? Yeah, I could definitely see why uh, they went with that kind of cockpit because during the time they have like a 360 screen where you can see your surroundings and stuff. So I could kind of see the creative decision to actually make a cockpit to kind of make a more of an interactive environment. Yeah. So I think that was a good call. On my, on my, my... Yeah, so what... Yeah, that looks pretty good. Yeah. How we put, how we did the cockpits, each one was different and each one had its own kind of spring. Uh, it was kind of, you know, like it could go this way, this way, this way, right? It could go every way. It was mounted on one kind of vertical spring mechanism, which we had to move. And we had a crane with a three axis head so that it could pan, tilt and rotate. So that we had to make it look like this type of stuff was going on. So that when when one of the like the lasers hit the the mobile suit, we'd smash the cockpit. So you'd have this kind of reaction, and then he'd, huh. and he'd twist the camera to make it fly away, right? <laughs> and we had That's amazing. The, oh, man. I can imagine the whiplash. Let's <laughs> <laughs> finish. Oh. And we had the. At least the, that had a, a camera on a crane on on a remote control. In the old days, you put a, a, a man and a, an assistant sitting on a crane. Well, we had a couple of those cranes full of lights because those the lights that were on those cranes were the other the the interaction in the, with the cockpit. Those were the other mobile suits and the other other um, ships. You know, the, the when they were doing battles, so they would those lights would flash and this would all have to work out with to sort of match this animatic that the visual effects people had made of the battles. 
So we had to kind of make a live action version of this kind of clunky, um, you know, kind of a crude moving storyboard that, that, that they had done quickly, you know? So it was a, it was a very, uh, it was a very busy shoot, let's say. Um, it looked good. The, the movement of the cockpits actually did look good during the, uh, the the explosions and the action scenes, actually. I know. I mean, but it, <laughs> it was just, you know, when you, when you think of what you have to go through sometimes to get that picture. You know, that picture, oh, a nice looking picture. Yeah, right. Um, you know, we had a lot of people working on that show. And... Uh, Okay, so you guys watched the movie, the the takeoff when they go through the G-force. Yeah. Yes, sir. The ring, the little I, track. I actually really wanted to bring this up, and um, I really wanted to show you this, but I actually still got the DVD. Well, that's great. Okay, I hear it. I can't see it. Too. Sorry about that. <laughs> I have the DVD also. Okay. Yeah, so um, we actually did a – which which, um, which is why, like, I, I really wanted to contact you because I really saw – I mean, I've seen this movie a couple days before uh, – a couple days before I contacted you about uh, – wanted to talk to you about G-Savior because I really wanted to know more, obviously, about your career as well. But also the what was going on in the background because I was reading about the production and uh, the producers of Sunrise, like what was their vision as well to engage in this. Did you face any like studio um, like interference with Sunrise? No, we had a. Um, um, it was uh, sort of difficult because our ultimate em emboss was this uh, Japanese toy company. They made the, the mobile suit models. And our uh, bosses were NHK, the Japanese broadcaster, who, who broadcasted initially in Japan. Now, those guys didn't speak any English, and we didn't speak any Japanese, so it made it a little difficult. <laughs> so we went through an interpreter named Buddy. Buddy, <laughs> Buddy was... Uh, the son of an American serviceman who had married a Japanese woman after the war. So he grew up in Japan and spoke perfect Japanese and perfect English. So he's a perfect translator. But we do things like that. I'd, I'd ask a question that might be uh, three sentences long and they'd talk for five minutes and then Buddy would go, no. <laughs> oh, man. You know, That's so. funny. <laughs> yeah. Um. I'm also curious as well. I seen the promotional trailer uh, to G Savior. It seems to be way different than what we was uh, getting from the movie. Did they have like a different story in mind, uh, or like a different script even? I don't know which. I mean, the, where where could I look at it? It's, it was. Yeah, it was on YouTube. Um, it was a trailer. The G Savior was in the colony flying around. Uh, it was being chased by these. Um, I don't know. That. What were those yeah, yeah. mobile suits called? Was it like Ray or something like that? forgot they were called. Even the ones in the hangar, the hangar scene that were like supposed to. Yeah, because those were rays. And which one are the boo -goos? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, the one I'm looking at right now on YouTube, this is pretty much our footage. And that's the trailer that's uh, a minute and something.
But here's this this promotional trailer, three minutes long. Well, it looks like they've they've uh, put in some other material along with the stuff from the movie. Yeah, um, I don't know. Yeah, because twenty five years ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, because um, I was doing some research on it, and I noticed the uh, the trailer, really the teaser, and I'm just didn't know if the direction of the film was supposed to go to another way uh, or unless they created the promotional uh, trailer before um, getting the movie uh, settled. Was it for sure? You know, it's hard to tell what, what goes on before and after a thing is made. I truly believe the movie suffers from the lack of animation and, uh, you know, 3D animation. I mean, people, in, if you look at the Gundam uh, cartoons or the, you know, the anime, you have a lot of mobile suit stuff. And I think those who, who uh, want to see more of that, they want to see a live action version of that. They didn't want to see so much, you know, people walking around in the space station or what have you, you know, I think they wanted more more of the fantastical and less of the affordable, if you will. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did some cool stuff in the, in the, the, like the, the Gaia uh, planet, you know, with the kind of Star Trek-y wardrobe and, you know, I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was, it was all fun. I never thought the script really added up uh well enough i mean you know i showed it to my kids friends when we finished it and they're, they're going what happened <laughs> <laughs> oh man um yeah because uh I, I could definitely see what you're saying on that um especially the uh, variety of mobile suits that we get from the anime series um yeah. have, you, have you watched any of the anime series like after g savior or no, I, I mean, I, I watched a bunch of it while making it. And then I finished the movie and uh, I started working on a series. And then I didn't, I mean, I worked, I did, I did sort of I'll be these jobs back to back to back. And I kind of, and when I came out the other side, uh, G Savior was in the background. I, I didn't go to pick up Gundam again. You know, I just, I, I got to ask because yeah. when I was reading uh, about about this part of the section uh, with the producer, he uh, it was said that he gave the cast and crew uh, uh, model kits. Yeah. Yeah. He gave you a uh, I believe it said that he gave you the uh, the PG Gundam perfect grade. We, we got a bunch of them. Um, yeah, my wife and kids made them. And now I can't remember the models, the numbers, or I, you know, I, I never became a, a Gundam nerd, so I don't know the the difference the, by number, what one to the other. It's oh. never too late. <laughs> <laughs> I like the one. I like the underwater. I like the beginning of the movie, probably the best, when the guy rescues the pilot who has fallen down in the water you know we had to we had to flood that that cockpit for that guy and uh you know i, th I felt the jeopardy i felt that was really that was really good yeah Wish we'd have actually it was longer yeah like um, one thing i do appreciate with the movie the main character what was his name again mark oh mark it yeah, Mark. His name is like Mark. Mark something, but um, yeah, Mark. His personality. Yeah. So one thing I did find very relatable, also as growing as somebody growing up in the Western 
Western culture and stuff, the humor in that movie was very Western. So some of the, the attitudes and stuff that they had gave me a good chuckle because I'm like, oh, that's something that somebody I know would say, or that's maybe something I would say. They, yeah, they tried. Yeah, we had a few ad libs in there. Now I've worked. With that. I've worked with that actor a few times, Brandon Elliott. Speaking of Christmas, he uh, stars in quite a few of them at Hallmark. Oh yeah, I I read about that. Yeah. Yeah, he plays in plays in Chucky. He was in a nine eleven movie a while back, like twenty some odd years ago. He was he was uh, one of the guys on the plane that uh, it crashed in Pennsylvania on nine eleven. It was going to go to the White House or something. He was played one of the guys that um, took that plane uh, away from the hijackers. Mm, uh, he was playing as the hero. I, mean, mm-hmm. um, I do was have he a hero. I don't, I don't know. He was one of them. I I, I don't think he was the. <laughs> yeah. I do have a question though, because um, when we were communicating back and forth, uh, you're mentioning that you were finishing up filming. Um, can you give a little detail about that, if you can? It's called. It's called uh, I'm not allowed to. Um, tell you the uh, truth. I'm not allowed to promote this movie. All I can say is that it is a, a Christmas romance movie. Okay. Um, and uh, I, in my contract, I'm prohibited from talking about it, mm. which I think is uh, unfortunate, but I, I really don't want to get in trouble for that. No. Like, I can't even put something on Facebook, you know? <laughs> yeah, those NDAs. I put a shot and I said, my office yesterday, but I didn't say anything about the movie. So, uh, do they get you know, strict on like, um, whenever it comes to like not disclosing anything about the, uh, the film? So yeah. Like, I, I don't know what the, I don't know what, yeah, I, it's an NDA and I don't know what the penalty would be. Oh, I don't want to find out. <laughs> I don't want you. I don't want you. I almost almost told you the title, but I'm not allowed to. (laughs) No, I'd I'd rather not have you get in trouble, Mr. Campbell. Mm -hmm. I I would like you to finish the film. Me too. (laughs) So, Mr. Campbell, I have one quick question also. The mobile suit designs, did you have any play and any part in how the uh, mobile suits should look? None, because they wanted to be very, very faithful down to the rivet of what they would be in the toys. Mm. Okay, because they wanted to be absolutely uh, secure. Now, maybe they failed at that, but uh, no, we we did not. The, the mobile suits were all animated. We didn't actually, uh, you know, they were they were CG. We didn't um, make on on in production at all. I was curious because there's um I found that the G Savior has a very similar design as uh, F91. It's another movie in the Gundam series. Uh-huh. I to know what was the, what some of the, the design language came from. What if they wanted to make it familiar with something else, or because like in the F91 movie they have the the shields that emit like an energy be an energy field. Okay. So also in G Savior, some of the mobile suits had an energy shield as well. With some similar idea. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know who owns the who owned the copyright to these designs. Uh, whether they were allowed to cross from one program to the other, I really don't know. Mm-hmm. One, one thing, thing we did was that we made the uniforms. We gave a bit of a our, We made all of our uniforms. So we give a bit of a kiss to the uh, animation, the anime series, that those uniforms look like the, the anime uniforms, you know, where, uh, you know, the, the bad guy's uniforms. Uh, was there any... Um, yeah, the Titans. <laughs> yeah. 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 Was there any, like, um, reusable props that you use from, like, let's say, another film that we should notice, or... The, the set, the main set, 
used for much of it was uh, from an, a, 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 a sci-fi show that had shot in Vancouver, but that got canceled after four or five episodes. <laughs> that was still there. So we had the same production designer. So we just modified that set to make it our set. Yeah, the interior, all those hallways and offices, and we had a hangar with, I mean, we did, we did build some more stuff, but, uh, but yeah, we used that, that set. I forget the name of the show that, um, that went down that we used, but. That's all. I'm, I'm clutching at straws trying to remember more here. <laughs> I do need to ask this one question. Um, this would be my last question for me until, like, unless T Von has anything. Um, I understand. So they did the filming in Vancouver, and now we have a the team from Sunrise, which is Japan. Believe the CGI animation team was in Santa Monica in California. Yes, they were. Um, and they also did a lot of this. They did two of the Star Trek series at the time. Same group. So, yeah. Oh. Experience when it comes to sci fi. So that's good yeah, to know. <laughs> yeah, you can see their language, the design language, and animation language in it actually yeah there there cool. was it um uh, what's the star trek that had seven of nine voyager they did voyage yeah oh watch that show so much for my dad that's crazy <laughs> yeah they they cool. the, the same, same visual effects team that did voyager nice voyager is a really good show yeah. Yeah. I will say that. All right. Um, generation. I like Voyager. I like Deep Space Nine. I like uh, uh, I like the very original Star Trek. I got into Star Trek, no joke, like maybe last year. Um, I took my time to I build up from um, from all in order, the Enterprise, the next generation. I mean, I know that's not in order, but, you know, I, I'm taking my time watching all of them now. Um so the next one I need to watch is I didn't see the new one on Paramount yet. Discovery? Not Discovery, but uh Strange New Worlds. Right. Yeah. Uh, I seen I seen the Discovery. At least I made it through the first season, so mm. but uh um we got a few minutes left, T Von. Do you have uh anything for Mr. Campbell? Um no more questions, but I have to uh, say thank you, Mr. Campbell, for having this time with us. Because whether people like the, the movie or not, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm very appreciative of the fact that you contributed to the Gundam universe, and yeah. I'm a very big fan of Gundam. So, okay, way, thank you for doing what you did, and thank you for okay. giving us those inspiring backstories behind what happened and how you, where you began and where you are now. And, the, and then the emotions behind your your directing, and I appreciate. Well, thank I appreciate you. It. Well, I appreciate uh, you know people finding me this needle in the haystack. Uh, now, I'll ask you a question. What are we What are we doing here? This is a podcast. Uh, and this is like a podcast, yes, sir. And does it have a name? Does it have a uh, believe it or not, Gundam is in the title, GSC, <laughs> <laughs> Gundam Space Engineers. Um, so Gundam Space Engineers, GSC. Okay. GSC, sir. Um, so you should ask uh, me more questions about Gundam then, or I mean, <laughs> GSC then. Well, yeah, uh, I was saving it more to the end. And plus, like, I was really curious about your, um, your film history, uh, your film career, uh, because like I said earlier, I'm wanting myself to also be a director i always want to produce film make films write stories and sort of um i want to i don't want to say product but i want to make something engaging where people i know will love yeah. well best of luck to you it's uh it's a it's a it's a rewarding but difficult uh journey 
Yes, sir. Um, that's why I've always like keeping up with articles and, um, I definitely had to contact you. I was like, man, you know, I really need to, to see if, um, number one, definitely like less uh, life lessons, uh, when it comes to the film industry and uh, as well as actually talking about G savior. So I, I, I know that was a bit of a random <laughs> email that I sent you about G savior. <laughs> um, but I, sir, I, I'm just got to say so. it's, it's an honor, sir. I highly appreciate this time with you, sir. Anyway, lift off, lift off at G Savior, the thing going around, and then you see the shot of the, 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 the ship taking off. We accomplished the thing by just sh shaking the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> just. <laughs> That's so, okay. Okay, guys, we're we're doing G force. Oh, 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 oh. no! And put put in some music and a big rumbling sound. There you go. Oh wait, before before oh, we get wow. off, I I almost <laughs> forgot. Does G Savior the G and G Savior? Does it actually mean Gundam? Because I heard it means Gaia. I. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I always heard it as Gundam Savior. Okay. Okay, because I was like, uh, Gaia Savior sounds better. Uh, yeah, but it kind of makes it makes more sense because yeah. you know it's it's uh, the battle took outside uh, was taking place outside of Gaia, yeah. and um, so uh, when I was uh, reading notes about the uh, the producer at Sunrise, he was saying like um, that the G stands for Gaia. I'm like, ah, uh, that sounds like it would like kind of throw things like, off with like fans. Sunrise is that Koichi Inoue? Koichi Inoue, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Did you ever talk to Koichi? No, sir. <laughs> no, I just right. Mm. Sort of taking everything with like a little grain of salt. Koichi was really handy. He um he lost a tooth what? while we were there. He lost a tooth and he made a new tooth out of I forget what and he put it <laughs> Did you did you like sort of give him like parts off your model kit and hand it to him or <laughs> no. <laughs> Man, that's dedication. Man lost a tooth on set. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Man, that's Yeah, that's funny. Come on, man. We, we can't end on that. How did he lose a tooth? <laughs> I <don't> no. <laughs> he told me he lost a tooth and he made another one, and his wife said he's very handy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <sighs> uh, I could see why that was retracted from uh, his notes. <laughs> the liner notes, so to speak. <laughs> Hey, I like that little bit of insider right there. <laughs> okay, so um, we done. I got to cook dinner here. Um, uh, yes, sir. We're uh, we are finished. Let me go ahead and just tell okay. our fellow uh, followers and uh, watchers. Thank you guys yeah. for tuning in as well. We also like to say our thanks to uh, Mr. Campbell here uh, joining us uh, with this interview. Um, it was a very amazing experience. I could say, uh, Mr. Graham Campbell, I am very uh, grateful and thankful for you to uh, come on to the podcast and join us. Okay. Well, that's the luck. Guys. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's, we're happy to have you, sir. It's an honor. It's an honor. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care. All right, my fellow engineers, as you have it, this is a uh, exclusive interview with Graham Campbell. And uh, yeah, I tell you guys, uh, he would be on. And here he is. You guys have a good day. Bye. Peace, y'all.